This is nitric acid, and it's one of the few acids that can react with copper. But oddly enough, it doesn't work well when the acid's pure. This is because of something called passivation, where a layer of oxidized copper forms, and it covers the surface, and protects the rest of the copper. To get it going, I have to add some water, which will dissolve the protective layer, and let the acid attack it. This more dilute acid can completely shred the copper, and all the metal should eventually disappear. I'm a NASA employee, and here's something you probably didn't know about space. So for the astronauts on the International Space Station, this is what the toilet looks like. But see, the toilet only has about a four inch hole, which is much smaller than the toilets on Earth. So the astronauts actually have to go through training and there's a camera inside of this simulation toilet that hooks up to a monitor in front of them so that they can watch themselves and learn how to properly align themselves on the toilet. So then the worst part is that the trash on the ISS isn't taken out all the time. So when that silver can gets full, they have to put on a rubber glove and kind of shove everything down back in the toilet. But if things escape, they have to go around the ISS and catch floating feces. When the trash is taken out, they launch it towards the atmosphere to burn up. So some shooting stars are actually just astronaut poop. So I teach an anatomy lab and I always hear this running water coming from this big uh, metal thing. So I'm gonna check out what it is today. Yep, I'm all set. What if the Earth was cube-shaped? On a cube Earth, gravity would be strongest at the center of each face. This means you would feel a pull to the center of each cube face. The edges of the Earth would be rocky and barren and would support no life. All of the water would be pulled at the center of each face. The climate would be very extreme. The top and bottom faces would be polar, and the remaining four sides would have an equatorial climate. The corners of a cubed Earth would poke out beyond the atmosphere. This means you would not be able to go there without a spacesuit. Amazingly, there's a real cubic planet just beyond the orbit of Neptune. This is called Ant, and it was discovered in 1884. I currently have too many females in the castle tank and too many males in the Mars tank, so I'm going to move some of my sea monkeys. Using the sea monkeys bubbler tool is the easiest way to move them, so hopefully we'll have some babies really soon. We don't need nothing but today, 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 today. The world is so small, till it ain't, till it ain't, till it ain't, till it ain't. I'm building up a wall till it break, till it break, till it break, till it break. Figuring out how disgusting my little brother is featuring a black light. Let's go to his room. All right, we've entered his room. Time to power off the lights. Let's turn on the black light. Just okay. Oh no! Oh my gosh! How the ceiling! <laughs> Um, if you are, like, smart with science and stuff, I need your help. Um, Hank, I'm looking at you, buddy. Um, I don't understand species whatsoever. Uh, and I've taken a lot of science courses in my day, and I have gotten amazing grades and all of them, but I still, I can't comprehend species, okay? So, like, I get it. Species are, like, animals are two different species if they cannot produce fertile offspring because they're so genetically different that they cannot create fertile offspring, right? These two giraffes are different species of giraffes. They cannot create fertile babies, right? Now look at these. These are all the same species. This and this, they could pop out any type of Frankenstein baby they want and it'll be perfectly viable because they're the same species. But these two giraffes can't have a little baby together. How does that work? Whale evolution.
I'm about to explain a problem to you that's at the root of all science. Most philosophers consider this unsolved and believe that perhaps it'll never be solved. It's called the problem of induction. There are many kinds of reasoning, but two main ones are called deductive and inductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is associated with Sherlock Holmes. We like deductive reasoning because the conclusion always has to follow if the premises are true. Here's an example. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Basic hard logic works every time. Inductive reasoning, though, is a bit weaker. An example might be, I've met this person a few times and they've been nice to me every time, therefore I believe that they're a nice person. Or more formally, I see B follow A every time, so I believe that B, as a law, has to always follow A. Now, as I'm sure we all know from our own personal experience, inductive reasoning doesn't guarantee its conclusions. Just because you see a pattern doesn't mean it's going to be repeated forever. It doesn't mean it's a law. The problem is, all of our scientific knowledge, all of our laws of nature, seem to be based on inductive reasoning. Our laws of gravity, electromagnetism, light, all work for the patterns we've seen previously. But they all rely on the assumption that that pattern's gonna continue. You might be thinking, no, 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 these are laws, that's different from like a pattern. But how do we know? We, we haven't seen these laws in a law book. We've just invented them to explain the evidence that we've seen so far. And if the history of science has taught us anything, a new discovery can cause us to rewrite the textbooks about everything at any time. This idea really starts to mess with you if you start to think about it, because humans very naturally use inductive reasoning. Think about the way you learned not to touch a hot pan or trip over. It was from having an experience, associating it with a negative outcome, and then assuming that that pattern would repeat if you did it again, so you just didn't do it. And the reverse is true. We do most things because we've had a positive experience beforehand and we expect that will be repeated. Human instinct is fundamentally inductive and inductive logic doesn't guarantee the outcome. If, so if induction is at the heart of all science, how can we have faith that science is going to work tomorrow? Most scientists and philosophers, when they hear this problem, despair a little bit and basically say that you have to assume on some level that the universe is going to hold to certain patterns, that the past in some way will resemble the future. But there was one philosopher who thought they found a solution. More on that next time.